once again good afternoon to all the participants in the physical space but also in the online platform um i had a quick conversation with the conference facilitators it's this time of the day it's been a very intensive day and we might be very exhausting so i'll do a snapshot of what i would have presented in a workshop we have agreed that we will do a webinar that will be more comprehensive on the topic so it is just going to be an overview of what i wanted us to talk about and so um can i have a microphone because i need to stand here So in 2020, 2016, I joined the University of Johannesburg and I was supposed to teach a, the equivalent of a module that most of you might know, life skills in South Africa is called life orientation. And so in that part of the module, the introduction, um, you talk about the self in relation to others. I started in June 2016 and it was very cold. And so I had a shawl on and that's why I have my shawl on today. And as I was teaching, the shawl would slip from my shoulders and I would just dramatically put it back on my shoulders and cover myself. And I would carry on teaching and then I would carry on and towards the end of the lesson, I asked them, oh, okay, so you've just met your new professor. It's a new class, new semester. How did you experience your new lecturer? All of them were like, and I, I'm normally a very quiet person and withdrawn, and as you can see. Uh, <laughs> and on that day, they're like, we love your we never had such a participatory lesson. And he said, sir, my friend says something. I'm not sure whether it's appropriate. I said, in my class, all goes. And um, I asked, can't she say it herself? And he said, no, she feels uncomfortable. He would rather say it. And he said, sir, my friend think you are gay. And the class went quiet. Somebody said the professor is gay. And then I asked, oh, wow, that's a very interesting comment. Didn't expect that. However, but I was a little bit deliberate with my drama and the show. And so she said, I asked them, why do you think I'm gay? And the one said, it's your shawl and i asked what about the shawl and she said it's a garment worn by women i said oh okay so you have women clothes and you got male clothes or men clothes and they said yeah no men don't wear shawls i said okay what else um you are too dramatic men don't behave like that okay and so already you can see certain markers and where these markers are taking you in terms of identity. And I realized my body became a pedagogical tool. I don't have to say much. It's how I carry, present and navigate that teaching space. And then they carried on with a whole lot of other markers. And towards the end of the comments, I said, um, what if I am gay? And the one said, Sir, I've never seen a gay professor. Okay. So there's another layer. Is that profession and sexuality now gets intersected. Firstly, it was sexual orientation and clothing. Another one said, I've never seen a black professor 
Busque. And that meant that my race got drawn into it. And another lady put up her hand in the class and she asked the question very with the chaos prof are you really gay and i said to her i don't know what really gay looks like but yes i am gay and she looked at me straight in the face and she said oh what a waste okay and although it sounds hilarious I realized that these various markers that I embody do not manifest in silos. I'm not just a black man, just a black gay man. I am a black professor. And I was at a university where most of your professors were predominantly white men. Okay? And so that brings another layer um, that you are a black professor and we've never had black professors. But there's an added layer that this professor is gay and being gay is something inferior and you are a waste. This brings me to what I wanted to talk about, if we can move the slide. I wanted us to unpack this topic of sexuality. What is sexuality? Because just in today's presentations, um, we have learned how complex this term is, how layered this term is, and how certain terminology, discourses, ways of talking can easily derail a message and the interpretation thereof, but also how it invokes so much emotion and how some bodies may feel affirmed or dehumanized. And for that reason, I rely a lot on the World Health Organization's definition of sexuality. It says, it is understood as a core being of being human. And it takes me to Kahola's uh, presentation, where children are seen as innocent beings. Primary or foundation phase learners now foundation phase is year one up to year three these learners are not seen as sexual beings and i don't know whether you graduate in age where your sexual being now suddenly step in one of the presenters talked about is desar who spoke about um he said that uh sex outside marriage is risky behavior and so you can see how sexuality is positioned. But the World Health Organization definition requires from us to look at sexuality um, as the understanding of and relationship to what? The human body. Emotional attachments and love. Love is contextual we had a very interesting discussion about inter intersex bodies and uh, different contexts and how it is perceived and understood today and so what love mean in the eastern cape would not be love in india mumbai and so we can see that sexuality is contextual and it's interpreted based on its geography and the spaces that it's used. It is sex. We've learned about that. And the confusion about 
sex and sexuality education kahola there's a great confusion when parents talk about sexuality and sex uh, i had a phd student who just is going to graduate next week and every time when she spoke to parents um, the parents would say no uh, i just tell them to google how people have sex and she had to explain that sex and sexuality are two different things the one is a part of the other it is gender identity now gender identity is a very interesting one i've done this huge study with intersex bodies and these intersex participants not intersex uh, transgender participants did not define them as transgender they defined them as men or women and i'm asking myself who decides on the term transgender is it a valid term and valid for who because none of my participants called themselves transgender they call themselves men or women in order for in south africa to change your gender marker you it's a legal on all your legal documents you need to be classified with gender dysphoria you need to get a letter from my psychologist classifying you or diagnosing you you see the pathology now with gender dysphoria and when we talk about gender uh, gender identity and transgender bodies for example they don't think of themselves in terms of sexual orientation because they identify as let's say a woman and when they are attracted to a cisgender man they don't see that they are gay or have same sex desires or same sex pleasures for them it is heterosexual because they identify as a man or a woman and therefore sexual intimacy intersect with sexuality and it is social it's psychological it's spiritual in australia we have the two spirited people and i i think you have read about this work very fascinating work where in the spiritual realm they might identify as female but in the physical world they identify as male and that complexity of expressing sexuality and gender get intersected and so you have political issues as well in africa we have there are only four or five countries i think that have um withdrawn if i can use that word um the the penal code that we inherited from our colonial masters some of them have introduced new laws um in some countries you can be punished with the death sentence so it's political and you must always understand when they introduce these harsh political or, or harsh laws through political avenues that most of the time we find that it's right before elections so sexuality and politics do not stand on its own and there's a lot of cultural dimensions next slide and for this reason we cannot afford to look at sexuality from a narrow single lens it is layered like my first experience in the classroom i was a black gay professor who's young i forgot that one as well because one of the questions was how did you become a professor at your age because professors are white old men and of course with my 
good jeans, you can see how good it looks. <laughs> For them, it was fascinating to see this very hot professor and hence this girl thought it was a waste. And so intersectionality refers to the interconnectedness of nature of social categorization such as race, class, gender, sexuality, disability. And, and for that reason, if we look at sexuality from a single lens or we pair it incorrectly, we are at risk to arrive at inaccurate interpretations and subsequently our interventions will send us down the wrong avenue. And maybe we need to rethink why after so many years we are moving on a snail pace. Is it because we are working in silos? Is it because we do not pair the right sectional sectionalities with your study? And it says that it exposes experiences across different intersections of identity. Um, I have a few colleagues as well who are doing studies on sexuality and disability. And a lot of people who identify as cisgender and abled bodies thought that, that people living with disabilities do not have sex. Because when we look at people with disabilities, we define them through their inability and we don't look at the abilities that they have. Let's go to the next slide. And so there I have given you some ideas of what intersectionality could look like. In South Africa, we have the concept corrective rape. This corrective rape happens predominantly among black communities. And so when we look at sexuality, um, how is sexuality perceived among black communities in South Africa? And if you deviate from these black communities, what can be done to you? Let's look at uh, another student of mine who's doing a study on gay men who are raped. When they report this to the police, my student found that, ha, huh, how can you say you were raped? I thought you would be lucky. Because gay men are positioned as hypersexualized. They always want sex. So how can you not like sex? How can you be raped? And then there's another thing that they bring in. You are a man. Why didn't you fight this other man? And so we need to, we cannot afford to look at sexuality from a single lens. And in the interest of time, I want to give you a brief homework that I want you to think about, explore in your own time until we get that time when we will do the webinar and I'll do a more extensive uh, uh, workshop on the intersectionalities of sexuality. If you think of your own research, first of all, I want you to think of real world examples. One of the challenges that we have, and I speak from my context that I know more and, and uh, I have more information about my context, South Africa and the Southern African countries. In that part of the world, we still um, fight for rights. Recognize us, visibilize us, acknowledge that we exist as South Africans. 
acknowledge that we are human beings and we live in South Africa. Human rights, are gay rights are human rights. Those are the, the, the discourses that we have. But if we only look at sexuality from a rights perspective, we might miss the opportunity on the health perspective, on the economic perspective. If schools are homophobic and violent to young people, the likelihood that they would drop out is quite great and many of them would miss out on improved life opportunities because they prematurely or was pushed out of the schooling system that would have been a ticket to a better life. And so what examples can you think about that does not or that lacks or inaccurately are paired with uh, inaccurately have pairs of intersectionality that could endanger your own work i want to think of your own research here reflect individually on a key research question project in your own work then brainstorm in groups how adding an intersectional lens could expand and change this work but this is an individual assignment that i want to give to you if you think of there was a i saw on the program and i missed this yesterday i'm so sorry about it was on traditional healers and queer bodies and i wonder what sort of intersectional lenses we need to have when we think of queer bodies and um, traditional healing. My own work that I presented today, parents would send or force their children to go to the traditional initiation to be cured. And if I look at that study, I was thinking of the mental health of these participants. How do they cope mentally? What's the psychological impact when they go through this initiation. Many of them only experience that the mountain becomes an inclusive space when they are there. But just think about the development until the day that they have to go, the fear, the anxiety that they are, uh, <coughs> sorry, that they are facing. And so when we think of our work in terms of gender and sexuality, we need to think of the multiple lenses through which the left experiences of these bodies are affected and impacted. And I think when we look intersectionality, intersectional through the left experiences of gender and sexuality, our, we will have a wealth of research that would never end. Your work around traditional healers will take you for the next 10 years if you explore all those intersectional lenses. Your work around foundation phase teachers, the intersex work in the hospitals, I can guarantee you there are multiple layers that will shape your work and bring a better understanding. And that's my assignment to you, to start thinking about your work and when we meet online that we have a deeper and very rich discussion from your own perspectives. I thank you.